We're going to talk about the Svazman blood generalization of the Brouwer Siegel theorem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and see this huge audience of people interested in number theory. And uh, I want to thank Alvaro and all the other organizers for inviting me to talk to you about my favorite subject, algebraic number fields. So um, I had to erase it, but Aiden, who is Liang's son, helped me start my talk. Um, and I'm going to try to lar write rather large. Um, can you see that in the back? Yeah? So far, so good. But very soon, it's going to get smaller. So <laughs> when it gets too small, you, you got to yell in the back. Tall guy nodding your head, OK? You promise? OK. Um, and also, like half of you, at least half of you were in mini course A this morning. Is that correct? So Liang's handwriting is like so much better than mine. So oh, I apologize ahead of time. So what do I have here? I have an algebraic number field, which I'll say I'll up degree n. So what that is, is it's a field. It has characteristic 0. So it contains Q, the rational numbers, and of finite dimension over Q. And we'll say, so N is, is its dimension. So already we have an invariant attached to the field, which is its degree. OK, so now what I'm about to say is probably going to be very familiar to you. And it only took me, I don't know, 25 years of studying this to understand the following subtle point. OK, so, when, so right now I've just given you the definition of a number field. And everything is funky dory. And this may even feel familiar. Like, you know, we, we know lots of number fields like Q adjoin the square root of 5, right? And all of a sudden, we feel very comfortable because we it's very concrete. But a, and, and in general, if you have a number field, you can always find some element alpha inside F so that when you adjoin alpha to Q, which means you look at all the rational expressions with with uh, rational coefficients in that alpha, the set of all such things, that, that gives you the whole field F. Yeah? And this, this happens if and only if 1 alpha, alpha squared, alpha to the third, up to alpha to the n minus 1 are linearly independent. And you can always find such alpha. In fact, the way you prove that you can do it is that the collection of all alphas which fail to do this are very small in some sense. So most alphas generically will, <laughs> most alpha elements alpha in F will satisfy this. But so the subtle point is the following, is that when I give you an algebraic number field, first of all, you say thank you. OK. <laughs> And, and then, then you say, OK, how did he give it to me? Like, how did he specify? So for instance, here. I gave you an alpha, yeah? And so what I did was I didn't just give you a number field. I gave you a particular lens through which to look at it. I gave you a model for it. So when we do this is that we are giving a model for f. So don't think so much that the field F is, so to speak, Q of alpha. But what it is, when I give you Q alpha, I'm giving you more information than just the number field. I'm giving you a, a model for it. And it may not be the best model. So for instance, I may have given you also You know, I could have given you this, and this field and this field are the same. But there's a sense in which we know that somehow this is better <laughs> than this one. 
Or I could have given you this. And this one looks worse than this, but it's actually somehow better. Yeah? And maybe this was discussed a little bit this morning. So just, just the subtlety here is that actually one, so the thing that I've come around to understanding is that one of the biggest problems in algebraic number theory is that we don't really have a canonical way to give each other number fields. And if we did, a lot of problems in number theory I think would be easier. So if you want a deep problem, which is very simple, so you want to think deeply about a simple problem, that's something good to think about. What is, a, what is the best way to give your friend an algebraic number field? Is there a best way? So for instance, if you wanted to give a graph, so do you know what I mean by a graph? Like vertices and edges. And so if you wanted to give your friend the graph, you could do it in a more or less canonical way by giving them the adjacency matrix of the graph. And it's, a, it's like you can, com you can put that into a computer and it's pretty much the way to give someone a graph. But what is, what is it, how do you give somebody a number field in a canonical way? So another way to say it is that I don't know a, a, a best alpha for a particular, I don't, I don't know that we have a best alpha. And, or even that that is actually the best way to think about a number field. All right, so let me go on. So now to a number field F and we have its degree, then we add this other thing called OF, which I think was defined this morning. And if uh, you subscribe to a particular French school, you also might call it ZF, which is very appropriate terminology. Because so inside the rational numbers, we have the integers which is this beautiful discrete subset. And inside F, we have the analog of, o, of Z called OF. And if you saw the definition this morning, it's the set of all elements in F such that for some polynomial G, which is monic and belongs to the polynomials over Z, beta is a root. So if beta is a root of some monic integral polynomial, then it's called an algebraic integer, and if it happens to be inside F, then that's, this is the set of all, all um, algebraic integers inside F. And this is called the ring of algebraic integers <coughs> in F. And in some sense, algebraic number theory is really the study of this ring. In a lot of senses, that's what it is. Just as number theory is the study of the ring Z, algebraic number theory is more generally the study for, of the ring of integers for any number field. And by the way, um, some of you who have studied this, you, you know the concept of something called a Dedekind ring. Richard Dedekind was one of the most brilliant mathematicians of uh, the 19th century, in my humble opinion. And actually, the Dedekind was the one who came up with the concept, with the definition of what a ring is. And it, it, you know, the very first rings that he was thinking of were in fact these rings, rings of algebraic integers. So a lot of algebra was developed through the study of algebraic number theory. Now, I think you also saw this morning the really important fact that um, you can study homomorphisms, field homomorphisms of F into the complex numbers. And for a number field of degree n, there's going to be n of them. And just to go really quickly about where this comes from is that if f is q adjoint alpha, then and f of alpha is 0, where f is the minimal polynomial. 
So that's the polynomial of least positive degree with integer coefficients, which is monic and on which alpha vanishes. Then you factor you factor the polynomial over the complex numbers, we know that um, it factors into linear factors. And then the map that sends alpha to alpha sub j um, gives you a uniquely defined homomorphism from f into c. And that's a map we call tau sub j. Am I being consistent with Liang's talk this morning? Yeah, OK. And now we get, so let's say that alpha 1 up to alpha r1 are all real, real numbers. And then alpha r1 plus 1 up to alpha r1 plus r2 are complex and chosen so that the other roots, because they have to come in complex conjugate pairs, the other roots satisfy alpha r1 plus j is equal to alpha j bar, where j goes from 1 to r2. Okay? So when we do that, we get a map from alpha to r to the r1 cross c to the r2, which sends alpha to um, the alpha i's. And then, you know, would send alpha squared to the alpha i squared, or 17 plus alpha to 17 plus, you know, it induces a homomorphism. And so what we get is an embedding of f into rn. If you think of c as having a real component and an imaginary component, so it has two real components. So this, you can think of this as just r to the n. And just as q is a dense subset of r, your number field f now becomes a, q de, um, a dense subset of rn. Okay, so your number field is somehow sits by this map inside Euclidean space. So now I'm going to ask a question, which I'm not going to answer, just like a real meanie. Okay, and all week you guys can, can uh, think about this, ha, ha, ha. So a question which I will not answer is, so now think of F sitting inside Rn. What is the maximal, so, so think of this map as giving you a topology on F, okay? And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Just don't answer the question. Throw the question away. Write it in the back of your notebook for later on, whatever. What is the maximal discrete subring of F? Okay, and really it suffices to think about this just in terms of like, just think of a quadratic field Q squared of 5, Q squared of negative 7, whatever you want. All right. So I think you also heard about the discriminant this morning, but just to, again, go really quickly over this. The, the really important first theorem about the ring of integers, OF, is that it's a free Z module of rank N, where N is the degree. So what that means, concretely, is that there exists a basis, there exists elements omega 1 up to omega N in OF, such that when you want to say what OF is, all you do is you just take the Z linear span of these elements. So it's basically saying, like, if, it was a, if Z was a field, we would be saying that this is a vector space over Z. We're just saying it has a basis, okay? 
And so now that you have a basis, so think about it in these terms. So F, so just a little sidebar. So F is mapping inside Rn. OF since inside here. And then OF is mapping inside something inside Rn. I'm going to call it lambda F. It's just this image under this embedding. F is dense in Rn. But OF is going to be discrete inside Rn. Just like the points in Z are discrete. And I think Leon drew a picture of you, like a picture for you of a quadratic field embedded inside. Was it Q squared of 5? That's the canonical example. Or Q squared of 2? Which one was it? Q squared of 5. Yeah. There are certain canonical choices. When, when I was a gra um, an undergrad doing a senior thesis, my advisor, Bernie Dwork, told me, OK, well, give me a prime number. And, and Keith, did you have Dwork too? Yeah, I think this happened to me when I said this in class. I asked for a prime. Yeah, what's going to happen? Yeah. I was expecting the answer to Keith. So, no, he said, so give me a prime. And I said, P, I said two. He said, oh, come on. That's not a prime. <laughs> and, and I said, three? He was like, oh, come on. And I said, five? He said, ah. Oh. <laughs> That's the prime we bow down to. <laughs> OK. So the prime five was very important in Dwork's life. I'm convinced of that, even though he never told me. But I, from that story, I really believed, and the kind of person he was, I think he worked everything. And he was the father of p-adic analysis. I think, actually, he gave birth to five-adic analysis and then just generalized from there. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so you get this lattice inside Rn. It's discrete, OK? And it's a subring. It's discrete, and it's a subring. OK. Um, blah, 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 blah. OK. So now, as a, sub, as a lattice inside Rn, just think about, like, think about n-dimensional space. Now think about a bunch of vectors inside there. And now think about taking all the z-linear combinations of those. You know, can you picture that lattice? Yeah? Well, the fundamental parallel pipette in there, the one where you take omega 1 up to omega n, and you just that fundamental thing has some volume. And more or less, the volume of that thing is up to some well-known factors. The discriminant squared, I think, of the, of the number field. OK? But the way, the way that we define it is that the discriminant of f, which is really the discriminant of of in some sense, although we, we almost never call it that. We just say the discriminant of f is the determinant of the tau j of the omega i's squared. So you take, you take the, the jth embedding of omega i, and you make this one, n by n matrix. And, but it's also, after a little exercise, it's equal to the determinant of the matrix of the trace of omega i omega j's. And these are all integers, and so you see this to be a, um, uh, that's how you see that this is an actually an integer. And just to give you some more facts, and I'm burning through my time, right? I'm OK. We're still OK. My mentor in um, grad school for teaching always said, don't, do not, do not ever cover the material. Always uncover the material. <laughs> so I basically, I have nothing to lose if I don't get through my lecture here. <laughs> you know, as long as you learn something, I'm OK. <laughs> um, so uh, facts. And I usually put these things together as um, combined together. but. I'm not sure if historically that's accurate or not. But anyway, the sign of the discriminant 
is minus 1 to the R2. And the, uh, the other thing is that the discriminant is an integer and is congruent to 0 or 1 modulo 4. And I'm having a senior moment right now because I can't remember the name of the person. Stickelberger's theorem. Stickelberger's congruence, that's true, because Stickelberger's theorem is something about. Do you know who the world's biggest stickler in math is? Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. So now here's what we have I have a number field. Its first fundamental um, invariant is n. Its second most, I mean, that the real object of interest is OF. And to OF, we attach this other integer called DF. And now I'm going to define sort of a normalized discriminant. Where I'm going to say the root discriminant of f is equal to df, capital DF, to the 1 over n, where n, of course, is the degree, the dimension of f as a vector space over q, and capital DF, just for convenience, is the absolute value of DF. So you take the nth root, that's why it's called the root discriminant, the nth root of the discriminant. And that's some kind of normalization. And also, sometimes it's useful to take the log. So there's also the logarithmic root discriminant. I may not use this again in the lecture at all, but just in case. So L R D F. This is just the log of the root discriminant. So which a quick calculation would tell you. Oh, am I writing in, in uh, blind spots? Okay. So this is just log of absolute value. Sorry, log of D F divided by the degree. Did I do that right? Yeah, I think I did. So what does the root discriminant do? It tells you not just the size of the discriminant, but it tells you the size as compared to the degree of the field. OK? And by the way, there's one other thing I should have said, which is the discriminant of the number field is very closely related to the discriminant of a defining polynomial. So you have a number field, you choose a model for it. That means you've chosen an alpha that has a minimal polynomial. That minimal polynomial has a discriminant in the usual sense, the product of alpha i minus alpha j squared, where you run over the differences of the roots. And that, that's almost a discriminant of the number field. And I think you discussed that a little bit this morning. And it's, it's a very subtle business, um, which has to do with finding the maximal discrete subring, etc. So, but I'm, I'm skipping over those things. The, 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 the philosophical point that you should take away here is if I tell you I have a number field of discriminant 5 bajillion and you want to know is that a big discriminant? Is that a small discriminant? Well, it depends a lot on what the degree is. If the degree is 100 bajillion and the discriminant is 5 bajillion, you would be very surprised. <laughs> Because it's, it says that the discriminant is really small compared to the degree. And so what this, what this does is it says that these two objects, the log of the discriminant and the degree, are somehow, they should be commensurable, or their commensurability is, is interesting. OK? All right. So now I have to. Since we're doing all of algebraic number theory in 50 minutes, so now we go to the next chapter. 
which is ideal class groups. So you'll be getting a faster version, I mean a slower version of this soon, but just, so inside this ring, it turns out that these rings are really beautiful rings with lots of beautiful properties. Um, there's something you can do which is called IF, which is the, the group of all non-zero fractional ideals of OF. So just think of the ideals of OF. You have two ideals, you can multiply them. You may not be able to divide by an ideal, but, but this fractional ideals it gives you a method for dividing by ideals too, so that you make a whole group instead of just a semi-group. Okay? And then PF, this is the subgroup of the principal ideals, principal fractional ideals in IF. So the principal ones are the ones that are generated by one element. Okay? And then the class group So the class group of F is defined to be the group of all ideals modulo the group of the subgroup of principal ones. And the big theorem here is that the class group is a finite abelian group. And when I was a junior in college and I took a a junior seminar, and it was with Professor Ching Li Chai. And one day he told us, today we learn about something very important. It's the ideal class group. Ideal class group is very mysterious. And he said it like that. And I remember just thinking, oh, I really want to know about that. It just, I don't know why, but it just, I was just like, I want to study that. So it's weird. You never know what it is a professor says or how he says it that like changes your life. <laughs> okay. So years later, like 25 years later, I went to UPenn and I was giving a talk and I told this story. I said I had a professor in college who really got me interested in algebraic number three because, and then I did this story. And I said, and that professor in this, is in this room. And Ching Li Chai was in the room and he was doing something on his iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> he was typing. He had no recollection that I ever was his undergrad, you know. And I said, that professor was Ching Li Chai. And he said, huh? <laughs> and I said, yes, thank you very much. He said, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. What did you say? <laughs> and I said, never mind. <laughs> so we, we talked about it later. <laughs> anyway, so the class group is a finite abelian group. And really, it's a hugely mysterious object. It's like... We number theorists, I think, walk around pretending like, oh, we know a lot and we solved for Ma's last theorem and blah, blah, blah. We don't even know like the most basic things about the class group. So for instance, the class group is often trivial, but we can't prove that it's trivial infinitely often. Okay? We can prove that it's not trivial infinitely often. We have lots of examples to make big class groups. But again, if you want to think deeply about some sim very simple things, Here's the question, is why and how often are class groups so often so small? So don't even think about proving that they're trivial. Just, just explain to me why they're small. They tend to be. So HF, by the way, is the size of the class group, and we call this the class number. And this whole business of the class number and class group and everything was started by this guy, my man Carl Friedrich, 1777 to 1855, 
who was a real jerk, by the way, a lot of the time. Um, not all the time, but there are lots of instances of him crushing, totally crushing, the dreams and aspirations and, of young mathematicians who are now, I mean, they, they survived. They're, they became giants on their own. But, you know, people like Jacoby and Legendre and lots of them were crushed by Gauss's kind of like huge ego. And, um, which is too bad. But he also was supportive of other people, so who knows? Anyway, it's not like, I'm not a real historian, so you shouldn't take what I say too seriously, okay? I could be getting it totally wrong. But that's just my opinion. Okay. So you have the class group, you have the class number. Then the next thing I have to tell you about is the unit group. So if you take this ring, one of the first things we do with a ring is we ask what are the invertible elements. Oh, you know, I should give you some examples <laughs> of class groups. Like, for instance, q square root of negative d, where d is say 3, 4, 7, 8, 11, 19, 43, 67, and 163. The class number here is always 1. Is there 9 of these? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Good. For any other negative d, um, the class number is bigger than 1. And that was a conjecture of Gauss which was proved in the 1960s. Um, and it has a beautiful long history which I won't go into. But on the other hand, if you take q square root of d, where d is positive, then Gauss conjectured, and we still believe, that infinitely often the class number is 1 for real quadratic fields. Like for instance for q squared of 5, class number is 1. But also you can have huge primes, q squared of p, for a huge prime, class number is still 1. But we have no idea why, and that's, yeah. Oh, a question! Oh my god! So good, yes. Is it known that it's not 1 infinitely often? Yes. In the real quadratic? Yeah, yeah. And that's, that actually Gauss knew how to do that. So the way you do it is, the easiest way to do it, you take Q adjoin the square root of, then take a bunch of primes and multiply them together. The more primes you put together, the more powers of 2 you get in the, as a factor of the class number. Okay? okay? Thanks for the question. And I, I promise I won't yell into the microphone the next time somebody wants to ask a question. I just got excited, you know. So unit group, the first thing you want to know about a ring is what happens when you look at the invertible elements? So these are the beta in OF, such that 1 over beta is also in OF. I'll just say it that way. And it turns out that, so first of all, you may have some roots of unity. So, you know, like negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1. So a, a number is called the root of unity if some power of it is equal to 1. And so we say mu F. These are the, I don't know, gamma in OF, such that gamma to the K is 1 for some K. And this is always a finite subgroup of OF cross. And so if you look at OF cross modulo gamma F, it turns out the theorem is that this is a finitely generated finitely generated abelian group and the rank is R1 plus R2 minus 1. And the example here, just I'm just going to be boring and do the same example over and over again, is that if you take epsilon, which is the golden ratio, then OF cross modulo plus or minus 1, which are the only two roots of unity, inside this totally real number field is generated by epsilon. So this is a field where R1 is equal to 2 and R2 is equal to 0. 
right? X squared minus 5 has two roots, and they're both real. Plus root, minus, plus root 5 and negative root 5. And so R1 plus R2 minus 1 is 1, and so the rank of the unit group is 1, and this is the generator. And by the way, in general, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly who the fundamental unit is, who the generator is. And if you can pinpoint the generator, you can know the class number. And if you know the class number, you can pinpoint the generator. So those two things go hand in hand. And how much time do I have? Till 12? Yeah, okay, I'm still good. All right, so I can give you the definition of the regulator now. So since it's a finitely generated abelian group, it means that, so there exists um, epsilon 1 up to epsilon r, R here is R1 plus R2 minus 1. This is what it means for it to be a finitely generated abelian group. It means that you can find units such that um, the unit group modulo the roots of unity is the group generated by epsilon 1 up to epsilon R. That means that every unit U inside OF cross has a unique representation as U equals epsilon 1 to the M1 up to epsilon R to the MR times some zeta to the K where zeta is a generator of the, it turns out that the group of roots of unity will be cyclic and maybe I should put a plus or minus here, but I don't need to because yeah, it's fine. Okay, so the choice, again, just like the omega one up to omega n, the basis of the ring, yeah. Yeah, I totally didn't tell you. Yeah, um, but when can you ask that again okay. after I after I state the Brouwer's Eagle theorem? What's your name? Kalyani. Kalyani. Yeah. Okay, so let's come back to Kalyani's question. Okay, because that's important. So, so we choose these generators, and then we define. We take the determinant. Uh, now, this is going to be weird, okay? I'm just saying. So you take the log of the absolute value of tau j of epsilon i, okay? And I'm going to put a little, like, I'm going to put a little cross over here. So I'll explain what that is in a second. And here, the, the i and j go from 1 to r. And, um, and remember that r is r1 plus r2 minus 1. So, and, and by the way, this, this double thing over here like this, this means like just the regular absolute value if, maybe I should say absolute value j here like this. Um, if j is between 1 and r1, and it's the absolute value squared, if j is between 1 plus r1 and r2 plus r1. This is just technicalities, okay? It basically says, so what we have is that we have this, um, these, if we take the log of everything, you see how this is a multiplicative group? If I take the log of everything, it becomes an additive group. Okay. Now, the, if you take any unit and you take all of its embeddings into the complex numbers and you take the product of all of those embeddings, you're going to get plus or minus 1. Because 
a unit is going to have norm plus or minus one. So if you take the log of all the embeddings, the sum of all of them will be zero. So if you just take the R1 plus R2 straight determinant of this thing, there's going to be a relation and the determinant will be zero. So what I've done is that I've eliminated one of the rows or columns, rows and columns of this thing to make an R by R determinant. And that's what this little thing is about. Anyway, this thing is called a regulator. And I'm, I may have botched the definition somehow or other and, and Keith is doing a terrific job just, you know, holding pat. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Go back to typing your email. Um, so, but it's Liang's job to correct everything I say, okay? I, one of the best things I ever heard, I'll come back to you in a second, was Larry Washington was giving a lecture on Fermat's last theorem conference and he said, someone pointed out that he had made a minus sign error. Somebody said, oh, 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 everything I say is true modulo the ideal of errors. <laughs> so, that's my, my standard. Yes? Can you repeat the definition of R1 and R2? Yeah. So if you have a number field, then you express it as Q adjoint alpha for some alpha. That alpha is going to have a minimal polynomial. And then that polynomial is going to have a bunch of real roots and then a bunch of pairs of complex conjugate roots. So the number of real roots is R1 and the number of pairs of roots which are complex is R2. Okay? So like a good example is if you have, if f of x is x cubed minus x minus 1, so this is a polynomial that cuts the x-axis only once. So it has one real root and it has a pair of complex conjugate roots. So when you cut out, when you join a root of this polynomial, you get that R1 is 1 and R2 is also 1 because it has one pair of. And by the way, this, this pair of numbers, R1, R2, is called the signature of the number field. Okay, so now I've given you all of the ingredients so that I can state the Brouwer-Ziegel theorem. But I'm going to give one definition first and then give the theorem. And Kalyani, your, the answer to your question is going to become evident after I state the theorem. I hope. Which is a way of saying, after I state the theorem, I'm going to come back and ask you to answer your own question. <laughs> Just giving you a warning. Okay. All right. So definition. So a sequence... <coughs> F1, F2, F3, etc. of pairwise non-isomorphic number fields. So I don't want you to like take the same number field and keep repeating it, okay? That's all I'm saying. A pair, uh, family, a sequence of pairwise non isomorphic number fields is called asymptotically good if the root discriminant of F sub J, where J goes 1, 2, 3, and so on. So if you take the sequence of root discriminants, is bounded above. Okay? And it's called asymptotically bad if it's not good. <laughs> okay? So let's, if we go back to the root discriminant again, so remember that the root discriminant is the nth root where n is the degree of the field. It's the nth root of the discriminant. So if I, take the, if I have a sequence which is bounded and I take the log of the sequence, it's still going to be bounded if and only if the original thing was bounded. Right? So I can, I can also think about the log of the root discriminant 
which is log of df over nf. So to be asymptotically good, it means that the log of the discriminant doesn't blow up as compared to the degree. Okay? The log of the discriminant stays tamed by the degree. Okay. Most of the time, this doesn't happen. So asymptotically good, you would imagine, is rare. Yeah? Because when something is good, like diamonds, right? You're not, you can't find it everywhere. So the generic behavior is that if you take a sequence of number fields, it's going to be bad. So let's, let me illustrate that with the world's canonical example of every time you think about a number field, you, or a sequence of number fields, or you want to test something out, you always think about the cyclotomic fields. Right, so that's where you take f, adjoin q zeta, some, let's say I'm just going to take p, because it's, it's simpler to describe here and it suffices. So if p is a prime, then zeta p is a root of, well, just, just to be concrete, I'm just going to say it's e to the 2 pi i over p. It's a root of the polynomial 1 plus x, blah, 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 up to x to the p minus 1. It gives you a beautiful number field to work with. This polynomial is irreducible of degree p minus 1, so this field has degree p minus 1. And this is one of those beautiful places where the ring of integers is actually equal to z square bracket, the element that you chose. And that means the discriminant of the polynomial is equal to the discriminant of the field. And so the discriminant of the field, you, you calculate it, or let me just say df is p to the p minus 2. And so the root discriminant here, which is you take p to the p minus 2 over p minus 1, does this remain bounded as p runs over the primes? Nuh uh. Right, the log of it goes to infinity like the log of the primes, more or less. So this is a sequence of number fields which is asymptotically bad. Now, this, this is a little weird, but it turns out that um, for the Brouwer-Ziegel theorem applies to asymptotically bad fields. So it sort of like tells you in the generic case, if you have a family of number fields, what happens. So think about asymptotically bad as the generic case. And now here's the brouwer Eagle theorem. Oh my god, I have two minutes left. This is so good. I get to state the theorem and then run away. <laughs> and Kalyani will be like, well, what are my questions? I'm like, you answer it. <laughs> brouwer Eagle theorem says if f1, f2, etc. is an asymptotically good family, asymptotically good sequence of number fields, then the limit as j goes to infinity of the log of hf times rf divided by the log of the square root of df. This limit exists and is equal to 1. So in other words, log of class number times the regulator is asymptotic to, to talk analytic number theory a little bit, <laughs> is asymptotic to um, let's say one half the log of the discriminant or log of the square root. So think of it like this. For the philosophy is if you have a number field, if you don't know the discriminant or the degree, then you know you don't nothing. I mean those are like those are the really fundamental things that you should be able to compute somehow. Think of them as more knowable. The class number and the regulator are a lot harder to know. Okay? 
So what this says is that this is the knowable thing, and the class number and the regulator together, their log is about the same size as the log of this. And by the way, here's a, here's a classic error which I've made at least 17 times. I keep making it over and over again. I think in my head, class number times regulator is about the size of the square root of the discriminant. How wrong is that? <laughs> if the log of two things are close, that does not mean that the two things are close. <laughs> Right? <laughs> okay. Um, so, Kalyani, so do you see how the class number and regulator are sort of tied together? Right? So, what's the answer to your question? What was your question? The question was that I said if you, if you know the class number, then you can determine the regulator, and if you know the regulator, you can determine that. So, if we know that the, um, the discriminant and if we know the class number, then we can get some kind of an estimate on the Exactly. Did you hear that? If we know the discriminant, and if we know either the class number or the regulator, we can get a hold of the other one. Has anybody studied physics here a little bit? Do you know the Heisenberg uncertainty principle about momentum times velocity? In my head, I, I don't think I've ever confessed this to anyone, but I'm about to on TV. <laughs> um, to me, this is the arithmetic Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There's lots of situations where we know the product of class number and regulator. We just cannot know one of them versus the other. And it's like the most frustrating thing for a number theorist. Now, um, just to end, since it was the title of my talk, <laughs> here's the Sfassman. So the brouwer eagle theorem goes back to the 1930s. Okay? The sfassman vladutz Generalization says, so this is part one, Brouwer Ziegel. Part two, Svassman Vladutz. If the sequence, etc., is asymptotically good, then this limit still exists. What? Oh, that was so bad. <laughs> Who said that? Who rescued me? Somebody. Thank you. I'm going to call you Eric Carl, okay? Because of your shirt. Um, Eric Carl. Help me. <laughs> okay, it has to be asymptotically bad for Brouwer's ego. So Asman Vladutz says if it's asymptotically good, then the limit still exists. And the limit, but the limit, let's call it beta, is somewhere between 0 0.5 and 1.3. I forget these exact, they're, they're, their bounds are tighter, but I forgot to look them up before the lecture. So we don't, we don't know what the limit is, but we know that it exists. And it's somewhere in that range. And now I've gone way over time and you're hungry for lunch, so thank you very much. Are there any uh, other questions for Fashi? Um, can you think about the regulator and telling you about like volume of some Yeah, yeah. So, so again, if you take the units, it's a, an abelian group. When you take the log, it when you take the log of the units, it becomes a lattice. Now, not inside n-dimensional space, but inside R1 plus R2 dimensional space. Um, and, and then the regulator is just the volume. Uh, but, it, but see, it it's lives, it's actually a one, one co-dimension co one subspace inside. It, it, you, know, that you have to get rid of one, yeah, one column and one row. But, but now what you get is a lattice. It's an R-dimensional lattice where R is R1 plus R2 minus 1. And the regulator is just the um, fundamental, it actually really, literally is the volume of the fundamental parallel pipette inside that lattice, yeah. So if you, if you work out the case of Q squared of 5, you can actually see the box. And you can take its volume. And you'll see that the, the, the regulator is, um, 
um, just at 1 plus root 5 over 2. Okay. Yeah? So, uh, in what cases discriminant of the uh, number field and discriminant of the polynomial are the same? Okay, so it's, it, you can create examples. So, for example, like here's an infinite family. Okay, and when that happens, by the way, the name for it is monogenic. Yeah. Right, so we say the field is monogenic if it, if it exists some alpha such that. And you can give criteria for a, for a field which it cannot be monogenic. And then you can give lots of examples of monogenic fields. There's not a really good theory. If you hand me a number field and you say, is this monogenic? I'll, I'll look around to see if I can find an alpha. I'll look for some of the criteria that I know will prove it's not. And then, but if it lives in that middle land, um, it's a computationally very difficult problem to answer, even in, even in particular cases. So it's not completely classified? It's not completely classified, not even close. Okay, so yeah. if I find a non-monogenic uh, number, uh, number field, and if I find, I mean, the ring of integer, suppose I have number field, then it is possible that there is no there is no alpha in the number field such that the discriminants match. There's there's lots of number fields where there is no we can prove that there will not be an alpha that such that the discriminant of the minimal polynomial of alpha is equal to the discriminant of the field. So so a simple criterion is if the if the degree of your number field has to be bigger than two because quadratic fields are all monogenic. Okay, but now if you have a degree bigger than two extension and the prime two splits completely in the field, which means that it's a field of degree n and there are n prime ideals distinct which divide two, then there's no way it can be monogenic. That's a simple criterion, for example. Okay. So, but it, in general it's a pretty hard problem. So if, if you can find a way to create monogenic number fields, that's kind of interesting in its own. Yeah. So this second case here, uh, the asymptotic period, are there any conjectures as to what the limit should be? Should it also be one? Um, so with some collaborators, we have some, we've created lots of examples where we kind of give bounds on it's between this and this. And no, actually we, we don't really understand what those limits look like. And it would be super incredibly cool to find an example where the limit was one, even though it was asymptotically good. And I, I could not, like, I wouldn't even bet a dollar one way or the other. Like, I have no idea um, what happens. There, but, but to go with your question, I did want to say that for a long time, it wasn't even known whether asymptotically good fields exist. It was only in the 1960s that it was proven that they do exist. And so at the time that Brouwer and Siegel proved their theorem, they were like, well, we'll put this, con we need this condition, but, you know, it's probably true for all sequences, but we need it for our proof, so we're going to put it in. Yeah? Is it actually unprovable that there's infinitely many trivial class groups, or is it just that no one's said it yet? No, 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 no. It's, it, there's no theorem that says something is unprovable in number theory. I mean, I don't know, you know. I mean, theoretically, there are things that are, no, it's just that there's lots of people who would, you know, like give their right arm to prove this. Uh, okay, maybe not. You know. <laughs> I don't think I would, but pretty close. No, nobody knows how to prove it, but lots of people believe it, and there's a whole set of heuristics. There's, a, there's sort of like a philosophy of why it should be that lots of number fields have class group. Uh, has have trivial class group and it's called the cohen lenstra heuristics and if you want to sink your teeth into something really cool and interesting just look up cohen lenstra heuristics and there's tons and tons and there's an explosion of activity around that recently and don't you have an arithmetic statistics something right so you'll you'll be you'll be learning about that and um, lecture three. what lecture three lecture three so the answer to your question is lecture three. <laughs> okay, so um, for Sheet, as you can see, I think it's the person that I know that knows the most about class groups. So
So uh, if you have questions about, about clash groups, he's also, I think, one of the friendliest number of theorists I know. So it's a great combination of knowledge and friendliness. So uh, we'll have uh, lunch. There's pizza.